Our next speaker this morning is Mr. Erwin Michel Kerjan. He's the Managing Director of the Risk Management and Decision Processes Center at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Michel Kerjan is an expert on the challenges associated with managing risk forecasting, financial planning, and public policy revisions associated with catastrophic events. His work has been acknowledged by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader, a nomination recognizing the most extraordinary leaders of the world under the age of 40. He has served as chairman of the OECD, and Erwin, you'll have to tell them what that means because I just have the acronym, David, just the acronym, of the OECD Secretary General Board on Financial Management of Catastrophes and currently co-leads the Young Global Leader G20 Paris Initiative on Global Risks. His book, At War with Weather, Managing Large-Scale Risks in the New Era of Catastrophes, earned him the prestigious honor of the Culp Wright Award, an award given for the most influential piece of literature on risk management. So if you haven't gotten that yet, uh, you don't have that with you for sale, do you? I'm sure you can buy Amazon.com. It's, it's, I'm sure it's a great book. Uh, he has studied at several prestigious universities, including Ecole Polytechnique, or Ecole Polytechnique, in France, Harvard University, and McGill University in Canada, and currently teaches value creation in the Wharton MBA program. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Erwin Michel. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Great. Get the coffee, stay awake, want a break for coffee, or you still good? Excellent. Well, first of all, thanks a lot to uh, Ed Pasterik. I can't see you, by the way, with the light here, but Ed is someone in the room. To Dave Miller and Greg Fulgate for inviting me. It's a great honor to be, uh, to be here in the middle of uh, many uh, leading experts in the room who are doing the work on a daily basis on the ground, so thanks, thanks for the invitation. What I thought I would do for uh, 15 or 20 minutes, just to uh, warm up a little bit, and then we'll have a panel discussion, is uh, maybe to um, step back a little bit and look at where the nation is standing today when it comes to disaster management and disaster financing. And uh, Pastor Rick asked me to uh, plug the NFIP debate into a broader debate, so that's what I'm trying to do for the first five minutes, and then I'll say for what about what I believe the NFIP is doing right and wrong, and where do we go from there? So I have a few slides here. Um, not how it works. Don't worry, they are not boring slides, they are entertaining slides. So it's not a lecture, it's not a two hour lecture of my ABA students here. I have six slides, so we'll see what I'm talking about. I think when you look back at the past 10, 12 years, you realize that, uh, well, our nation went through quite a lot when it comes to disasters. I'm just going to use a few examples here to give you the tone. You start with 9 11, a few weeks later, the Antrax crisis, a few months later, the Enron welcome crisis, a few months later, the SARS pandemic starting in China, but spreading around the world in a matter of weeks, the Columbia shuttle explosion, 2003 massive blackout in North America, north of the US and Canada. We lost electricity for about 50 million Americans and realized that one of the big challenges of the next 20 years will be the question of our, the aging of our critical infrastructure. Obviously, on the national disaster fronts, 2004, <coughs> 2005, 2008, hurricane and storm surge, uh, Katrina being the big example, but not to forget the other hurricanes, as you know better than anyone, and Hurricane Hike here in Texas, 2005 demonstrating very clearly that even the largest economy in the world remain very fragile when it comes to dealing with a new era of catastrophe. And if you move from the U.S. to outside of the U.S., uh, you see very clearly that many other countries have to go through that new era of catastrophe very uh, vividly in the past few years. Think about Haiti, think about Japan, one of the most prepared countries in the world 
when it comes to earthquake and steel. Um, it would take, my saying, it would take five or ten years for Japan to recover from what was a large natural disasters and technological disaster. Close to us here, the BP oil spill, another black swan, another impossible event, another historical event, but still it happened. And closer to us, the 2011-2012 tornado season. And obviously I won't be complete if I were not to talk about the worldwide financial crisis, starting here in the US and spreading very quickly to the rest of the world, and from which we're just starting to work in. I move here, that works too? It's good? Perfect. They're good. They're very good. Uh, the financial crisis starting in the US and spreading around the world, and from which we're just starting to recover, to be honest. And for which we had to borrow a lot. A lot of money from our own children and own grandchildren. We were necessarily asking them for permission, by the way. And we had to borrow a lot of money from China as well, which raises another interesting set of questions about our relationship with China moving forward. But that's another topic here. Well, so here's my favorite uh, picture ever to summarize what we went through under the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> and that's really what we felt. I don't think of any other country that went through as much trouble than we have. Not even talking about two wars we had to fight obviously. On the one hand, I'm fairly optimistic about the future. Uh, we are, after all, a very resilient country. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that the uh, business models, the public policies that were developed 30 or 40 years ago to deal with disasters, under the impression that these disasters will only happen every 20 or 30 years. Very reassuring assumption. And it used to be the case, by the way. Well, clearly that's not going to work very well in an environment where we get a disaster happening one after another. Almost. So what needs to be done? Well, I think uh, instead of uh, pushing the private sector against the public sector, I think it's time to uh, go back to the drawing board and ask a tough question about how we want to prepare America for the 21st century if we see the new norm. Well, let's see whether it works here. Uh, the main problem, and uh, Mr. McNamara talked about it uh, eloquently, I think one of the big issues we are facing is the recognition that we are actually increasing an untold but massive financial liability. Just looking at the disasters of the past 10 years and what's going to happen in the next 10 years, I think that's a big issue. And we can either not look at it or start to look at it and ask the tough questions, which is, well, what should we do about it? So I think the uh, solution will come from some type of collaboration between the public and private sector, uh, building on the strength of both sectors and trying to work together. So that's the, uh, the big picture here. Let me go back to the NFIP. Um, when I was preparing my remark, I wasn't sure whether I should be diplomatic. Um, until yesterday, I was advising the French president, Sarkozy, who lost the election yesterday. So I'm advising a former president now, which is very different, trust me. Uh, well, the NFIP has been, so I decided to be blunt and tell you what, what I think. I think it's become way too easy to play the blame game vis a vis that program. Um, which is a very unique program when you look at the entire planet in terms of program existing for helping people in need during disaster time. I think it's been way too easy, and um, what I've said, I've said it to Congress, I've said it to other stakeholders, to the media. I think that program has provided immense benefits to millions of Americans for years now, since the inception in 1968. So what's wrong here? Well, what's wrong is people look at what happened during 2005 and look at the current debt of the program at the right number now, let's say 18 billion and less, or 17.5, just to make you happy. Uh, and concluding that because that program is running a deficit, we should get rid of the program altogether. Have you heard that? I've heard that. Well, I think we are missing the point here. Um, when you look at the financial balance of the program, and my team at the Wharton School has been lucky enough to get access to the entire data set of the program, the counting policies in force. 
Um, so we have been crunching data for the past few years now. When we want to look at the financial balance of the program before Hurricane Katrina and the two sisters returned well now. Well, um, that was doing okay. It was not a great money-generating program, but that was doing okay. And then 2005, 2008, hurricane season, and then $18 billion bid bar. So I talked to my friends in uh, the Tea Party. Uh, yeah, I have friends in the Tea Party, too. And like, you know, I don't really understand. On the one hand, you're blaming the NFIP for having borrowed $18 billion to pay the people who had bought flood insurance for years. They deserve it. At the same time, you don't really uh, say a lot about the $89 billion that was given to affected states and victims of disaster who did not buy flood insurance. You're not, com you're not complaining about the individual assistance program. You're not comp complaining about the uh, very specific program, the Road Home program that was given to Louisiana. You're talking about $9 billion. You're not saying a word about the low interest SBA program as well. So I think the $18 billion has to be put into perspective a little bit here. To me, the $18 billion is nothing but the government meeting its commitments vis-a-vis -vis its clients, in that case, insured people. I would hope that a private insurance company, and I work with many of them, if that company didn't have enough capital to pay its claim, well, that company will go to a bank and ask for a loan. So the people that are, who are covered by this company will have the ability to recover through the payment of the claim. But that's exactly what happened under the NFIP. And by the way, that's what the NFIP was designed to do. So let's not blame the program for what the program was designed to do. Let's recognize that and move, move on. The conclusion is not black and white, obviously. The conclusion is, well, it depends. In many instances, uh, the NFIP will indeed charge a lower premium than what the private sector will do. But in many other instances, the private sector will actually beat the NFIP. The reason being that they will be able to price at a much more granular level the risk that that very house is exposed to, instead of averaging the price across flood zone. Well, all of that to say that unless you do analytical work, you close the door, you bring the top minds around the table, and you do the work, getting access to the data, there is no way you can see that. Maybe during the panel we'll talk about the real question about privatization. The real question to me is more, under what conditions will be able to open some of the barriers that the private sector is currently facing? So the private sector can start, start looking back at whether or not flood insurance is indeed insurable in some part of the country. And by doing that, complement what the NFIP is currently selling. And by doing that, having many more Americans being covered. That's what I mean by using the strength of the public and private sector. Let me conclude here and turn back to the, to the uh, Master of Ceremonies. Let me conclude by summarizing a few points here. Point number one, you got me on that, I think. America is at war. America is at war against extreme events. No question. It's not going to get better, by the way. Notice, please, that I haven't used the word climate change whatsoever. You don't need even that to see that it's growing up. Mathematically, it's growing up. More people are living in this area. Two, the NFIP has indeed played a very, very central role in helping millions of families recover from what is already a very uh, complex and difficult time going through a flood. And here I would like to quote and really thank all of you because if the program has been as effective as it has been on many fronts, thanks to all the good work all of you are doing every day on the ground when our dear Congress is debating about other issues, you are actually doing the work on the ground so that that's happening. So thank you. The last point is, well, of course we can make the program better. We spend a lot of time with uh, the Senate and the House making sure that the bills, which are pretty decent bills, long bills, uh, include a series of analysis studies that will help decision making. So if we go for one or two year reauthorization, I think we'll be able to do a lot of things. And finally, on the private uh, sector, I think it's time for my friends in the insurance industry to look at that risk again, 
in the 21st century, in 2012, and ask ourselves, could we do that business? Seriously. I think the level of technology is radically different today than what it was in the 60s. And when you move from the US to 150 other countries, you realize that countries like Germany, France, the UK, all have a private sector very actively involved in flood insurance. Not to say that that's the way to go, just to say that it's possible elsewhere. Thanks again for the invitation. I'll be here all day. Look forward to the panel.